everyone. Um, my name is Stephanie Williams. I am joined by uh, Lev Strong, a good friend of mine. We were supposed to do a, a panel this year at Heroes Con. That didn't happen, but it's okay because we're doing it virtually. So we're talking about romance and comics. And we're going to talk about the good, the bad, and the downright messy. So Lev, do you want to, do you have anything to add before we really get into this? Um. I love mess, so this is going to be really good for me. <laughs> All right, so um, so the reason why this subject just appeals to me is because um, I really love comics, and coming second to that is romance novels. So whenever um, romance and superhero stuff intersect, I am in my happy place, even when it's terrible, um, which it often sometimes is, but... <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about the good. Um, so one of the relationships that I want to talk about is Big Barda and Mr. Miracle, um, because okay. I think that they're amazing. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think that they're really great. Um, I was actually pretty new to their relationship. Um, I want to say about two, three years ago, I kind of really got into it. And when you think of Big Barda, you think of someone who is just ready to kick your ass, but for justified reasons. Um, mm -hmm. And then you have Mr. Miracle, Mr. Escape Artist, um, and both of them come from um, Apocalypse, and they had Granny Goodness there to raise them, and nothing beautiful or good can come out of that, but they do, and their relationship does. Um, and I just really love it because, you know, everything that they've been through, um, they should be they should be hard. They should be hard. They should not be uh, willing and acceptive of love or any of that because they didn't experience any of that <laughs> while mm -hmm. growing up. But they are still able to um, find that um, in themselves and in one another. And one of the greatest aspects about that relationship that I love is the fact that Barta herself is not minimized in order to prop up Mr. Miracle. Because um, a lot of times in these relationships yeah. and comics, and especially between superheroes, like you see that. We'll get to some of the examples in the bad where that happens quite frequently. But <laughs> for them, yeah, right. <laughs> but for them, um, you know, it just really, it doesn't really happen. Um, there's a panel that I really love where uh, Barta ends up getting, she goes to go say Mr. Miracle. And by the end of the comic, uh, it, the uh, roles switch. And he's saving her. And I love it because he says to her, because she's having this moment where she's like, you know, I, I'm supposed to be doing this. I'm the warrior. I'm this and I'm that. And he says, well, yeah, like you totally are. But also at the same time, you know, you're this woman that I love. And I want to protect you just as much as you want to protect me. Um, and also she tells Batman, I mean, tells uh, Mr. Miracle when he's with the Justice League, like, hey, I don't care what Bruce is talking about, bring your behind home. So it's just something about the relationship. It's just always been cute. And I love that the love is so apparent in the relationship, regardless of what they went through, um, dealing with granny goodness. And then they go try to go take out granny goodness together um, on top of that. So um, again, like I can talk about this all day, but I'll switch off to Lev. So um, who do you have for your good examples? Um, I think it might be a, a little patchwork because they are not always canon. And okay, they're mostly canon in the Justice League cartoon, which I know is strictly speaking, not comics, but bear with me. It's fair, we'll um, it. Because, and this is also a, a, a ship of comparatives as well. Um, I want to talk about Bruce Wayne and Princess Diana of Themyscira. Oh, okay. Love me some Wonder Bat. Um, they are also very much a couple that is based in, and I think like this is going to be a recurring thing. Like their dynamic is rooted in such an overwhelming mutual respect, mm -hmm. rather than um, you know a one-sided admiration of like oh boy a big muscly guy or you know oh my god she's so beautiful. But they like respect each other for their abilities and like it's just it's very nice and refreshing to me there's an episode in particular of justice league i'm pretty sure it's still regular justice league and not unlimited it's, it's regular i know what episode you're talking about where they're on the rooftop and he's yes. like it'll never work because our things are dangerous and she like crushes a gargoyle with one hand and she's like next 
like respect a woman who loves and gets what she wants. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I really like the idea that like it's one person who is like set himself up as like an antithesis for any kind of like romantic entanglement, but like opening himself and allowing himself to be vulnerable, not even just in a romantic sense, but like just open about who he is with, um, you know, somebody that he trusts and respects because the only other person on the team that he really does that with is Clark, which is something we'll talk about later. Yes, uh, we absolutely do. <laughs> Um, so, uh, another relationship that I want to talk about, which is one that, um, is also not necessarily, it's not new to me at all, um, mm -hmm. because I'm talking about Mary Jane and Peter Parker, but the time where they, like, right after leading up to them getting married in, I don't know, maybe a good year or so or two while they're married, um, it's beautiful. It's a sweet spot. Um, the Amazing Spider-Man, also Peter Parker, the Spectacular Spider-Man, has some really great stories that involve Peter and Mary Jane as this newly married couple. Um, as Peter, you know, kind of reconciles the fact, like, hey, I am Spider-Man, but also I am also I'm a, I'm a human being as well. That um, owes those that I love them like this, this, um, to be there for them. Um, and I bring this up because, uh, before he even, uh, proposes to Mary Jane, I think he, Felicia Hardy shows up and Mary Jane, they both show up at the same time at his apart apartment. So Peter is still, you know, being very much Peter after he comes back from secret wars. And in this process, he is like, coming he's he's at a point where he's comfortable with being spider-man um but he's still feeling um this this void this this missing piece and at the time it is mary jane watson so he proposes to her and she tells him no and i'm like yeah you should have told him no because felicia <laughs> was definitely just at his <laughs> at his apartment like a day or two ago so i understand but and they um, were roommates <laughs> Right, <laughs> right. Um, but there's this beautiful part that happens, um, I think either before she says yes or after, where she's dealing with some family issues. Her sister is locked up, um, her estranged dad has come back into the picture, and she calls Peter to say, hey, I need you right now. And New York is having their own woes and problems in this issue because there is a villain that is on the loose, but Peter actually hops on the plane and says, you know what? Um, you know, Mary Jane has always been there for me. I want to be there for her. And he says, you know, that's what police officers are for, fire department, and also uh, EMT is like, I'll let them handle it right now. Don't know what they'll, <laughs> what they'll be able to do, but I'll let them handle it. And he goes to Philadelphia to see about Mary Jane. And even when she comes to the decision of what it is she's going to do about her father and her sister, Peter gives her the room to make that decision by herself without including what Peter Parker as Spider-Man would do. He acts as Peter Parker, this man who loves Mary Jane. Um, another thing about the relationship that I really love that I think it's just really important if you're with somebody who happens to be a superhero is the lines of communication. So before Peter would keep Mary Jane too, they would keep a lot of stuff from one another um, and thinking that they can handle it by themselves. And that just wasn't very functional or healthy at that. So you have a lot of times through this, you know, year or so uh, time worth of stories or whatever, where Peter is like, well, I was going to lie to you, but that wouldn't have been good. <laughs> so he goes ahead and tells her like, well, Sorry. this, oh, that's okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This thing um, is bothering me. I need to look into it. Um, you know, I was going to take a walk around the block and come back at 4 a.m., but this is what I'm doing as Spider-Man. Mm -hmm. um, and then also she kind of deals with that and, let it, um, and letting him know that, hey, um, I do not like this. I'm still uncomfortable with it because I don't want to see you hurt, but I also understand your obligation and why it is that you want to do what you're doing. So um, this just really, really made me like Peter Parker more um, as a character. Not that I never cared for him, but it just, I don't know, like it just opened up 
for me, like just more depth about the character and all that Peter has to, um, you know, deal with as Spider-Man and how he grapples with that. So that was a case for me where um, the romance aspect really added something to the character that I've known for a long time. But I'm like, oh, so you're dealing with regular stuff too. That's, I, I like that. I, I love when we see these heroes to deal with everyday things because it's a reminder to us that, um, you know, there are ordinary people with extraordinary powers making the choice to do extraordinary things when they absolutely don't have to. Okay. Are you ready to... While we're hanging out here in the spider corner, I might as well just come clean with this. My next one is uh, Eddie Brock and the symbiote. Thank you so much. Okay, because I didn't want to be... Ah! It's just like, okay, difference. specifically yeah. the Mike Costa run balances this so perfectly, mm -hmm. but, um, like it literally at points says like, this is a love story. Yeah. First of all, I love the idea that like, it's a relationship that started off in a very unhealthy place. Sure it is. Um, based in very negative emotions and mm -hmm. then like evolved into something where they like, they make each other better. And I'm all about a ship dynamic where people like improve each other, mm -hmm. not in like a naggy way, like, oh, you better be better at doing the dishes or whatever. Because I think like, well, like, you should do the dishes if you're in a relationship for Shorzies, but like that kind of like nitty, like, nah, 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 nah. like, I don't yeah. like how that gets played out a lot in media, yeah. but like Venom has like notes of that where it's like, well, definitely symbiote we should not be eating people left and right for starters and he's like okay so it's like just even with like little concessions like that and like man the costa run just makes it super are there are there children in the audience <laughs> maybe well <laughs> possibly but so okay but yes but also i wanted to add <laughs> i wanted to add to that um from that costa run is that you get to see them as parents Yes, that, yes, exactly. Um, fixed, yes. And them kind of grappling um, with empty nest syndrome. Mm -hmm. um, there's some, I mean, it's Venom, but like Venom's dealing with empty nest syndrome and it's this thing of, but hey, we still have each other and we're still going to continue to grow and we've done the best that we can mm -hmm. with our offspring and we'll trust that they'll make the best decision when they, when they leave. Yeah. And it's just so, it's beautiful. Yeah, and uh -huh. it's also a, a relationship that's deeply rooted in the emotional. Um, there, I mean, there obviously is a physical element. They are literally bonded at a molecular level. But, like, so much of their back and forth is, like, psychological. And they talk about, they talk about their feelings with each other, mm -hmm. like, pretty unabashedly. Yes. Um, and you get to see what it's like uh, for the symbiote, especially, um, with Eddie, like, not so much, you, you get to see him in situations where he doesn't express himself mm -hmm. in a, um, in a positive way or, like, a constructive way, necessarily. Uh, early on, I guess, in the comics, when he's just Eddie Brock and he's kind of just a butthead. Yeah. And yeah. it's just like, meh, Peter, I'm here to just be mean to you because I'm that bully character walking around in the background. <laughs> and things change. Um, but, like you get to see in the Costa run again, like um, the symbiote when he is in a relationship with, or where he's bonded to somebody who doesn't respect that bond and doesn't treat him well. Um, and like literally the entire center of that relationship is called symbiosis for a reason. Yes. Like it's just very weirdly wholesome. Um, it is. And they both heal each other too, because yeah. um, you bring that up and I think it's, um, one of the Kree um, had control over um, the Venom symbiote or whatever. Mm -hmm. It was making it do things that it didn't want to do. So yeah. um, that relationship with Eddie is just kind of rebuilding that trust and working mm -hmm. through uh, the trauma of that. So again, like the romance, it's, the romance leads to good things. It leads to really great character development. And yes. I like it when it happens in a good way. Um, so I guess we'll segue into when it doesn't really work. Um, <laughs> so, <sighs> if you follow me for a while on Twitter, you know how I feel about Black Panther and Storm for justifiable reasons. Um, 
And it's kind of the same thing. Uh, I think of them uh, the same way I do of um, Sue and Reed Richards. Um, the relationships can work. Um, the example I think of, I know right now um, in the current run of Black Panther, like, you know, it's tolerable or whatever, but the story or the run that sticks out the most to me when both of those relationships you see how it when it when it's good it's good or when it's written well it's it's really good um is uh Dwayne McDuffie's uh Fantastic Four initiative so uh this is after civil war has happened and all of that and uh, Black Panther and Storm join the Fantastic Four for a short little while um I forget what they're figuring out but they like go to space and stuff and <laughs> you see um, you know, T'Challa is being T'Challa the know-it-all and, you know, saying like, hey, you know, we're going to go visit the, um, it's not the Beyonder, I think it's, um, I think the Watcher is who they're going to go see. And he's like, yeah, well, the Watcher, if you've ever met him, is he's this and that and like Storm and the thing and everybody else is like, hey, you're not the only one who's met the Watcher before. And Storm just kind of shuts him right up, like, yeah, we, we know the drill. We've done this before. Um, but in that entire um, short run or whatever, Storm is never mem minimized. She's not used as a chess piece, which often happens um, in the Black Panther books when Storm is present. I mean, Doom War is starts off with T'Challa pretty much um, sacrificing his wife for uh the good of Wakanda um, or whatever. And that's what we get. Like we get a lot of that before Shuri takes over the mantle, Storm goes um, to put herself on the line for him. Um, is that very much a part of Storm's character? Yes, it is. But the fact that we really don't see it back and forth as far as T'Challa really being vulnerable with her in that way always irked me. Uh, cause we kind of get that. Cause I think of, uh, again, like Big Barda and, um, Mr. Miracle and you have this back and forth vulnerability and I just, we don't really see that or haven't, hadn't really seen that a lot between Storm, um, and T'Challa. And part of that is because of, you know, how those characters are outside of each other. But to me, that's why that relationship has never really worked. Um, Reed Richards and Sue, whew. All right, so <laughs> I enjoy this relationship for all the wrong reasons um, mm -hmm. because it is very messy and Namor is involved and I kind of like that, <laughs> you know, even though he and Sue have never actually done anything, that's always like that person in the peripheral just waiting mm -hmm. in the wings for um, Reed Richards to to not come ever back from a mission. And actually when they thought that that was happening, he swooped right on in. Um, and Ben Grimm was actually on the side too, waiting to get at Sue. So um, I don't know, maybe Reed needs to keep better company. But anyway, <laughs> never really <laughs> appreciated how, um, you know, Reed is just this, uh, this amazing mind and does all these great things. And because he is such an amazing mind, he's saving the world. Um, when he puts the relationship on the back burner, it is supposed to just be okay. Now, this is a trope that is not just relegated just to comics. We see it all the time where we have very smart, powerful men that are in relationships and their, um, you know, their spouses or whatever are just kind of supposed to be there to just kind of deal with it because it's okay because they're saving the world. But um, I don't know, it's just always brought me the wrong way. Now, in initiative, you see them kind of tackle that and you see the love that Reed really does have for Sue because he does love her like that. They do love each other. Um, but I really like when she's able to, um, you know, let them know. And she always lets them know. She lets everybody know <laughs> when she's not happy with some with something. And I really kind of like the way the, the realistic way that that conversation happens in the initiative. Because I like to see them happy. I, I like to, not storm a BP. I don't really care. But for them, I, I, I like it. Because the, the love is mutually there and it's always been there. Okay. I am done rambling about my bad. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I've got two. Um, we'll start with the most obvious. We'd, we, we'd be remiss not to mention um, the Joker and Harley Quinn. Oof. Oh, It's just bad, guys. It's bad from the jump. Just everything is not good about that relationship. <laughs> like, 
Like Joker, Joker is not a good person, obviously. Like he uses her. Um, he gets mad when she does things better than him. Mm -hmm. um, there's that, you know, iconic episode of Batman, the animated series, Mad Love, that goes into their origin. Right? And I think they later turned it into a comic or it was a comic first and they adapted it. But it's the same same writing. It's Paul, it's Bruce Tim Paul Dini. But yeah. like they she captures Bruce and she's got him dead to rights. He would have died, but he convinces her to, you know, call the Joker when the Joker shows up, he gets furious that he wasn't smart enough or good enough to catch Batman, but she could. And he literally beats her and throws her out a window. So not good, mm -hmm. not good. And like every iteration, like even the gross ones that try to romanticize that, like it's, it's never good. Not a positive thing to say about that interaction whatsoever. Listen, any man that is willing to push you into an acne vat, no, does no. not care about your skincare. So then, Ford no. does not care about you. It's true. <laughs> it's, it's true. Just, it's just a no. Like there are many things you can say about the Suicide Squad movie, um, and I've said them. Uh, I I love that terrible, terrible movie. <laughs> it's okay. We're in a safe uh, space. <laughs> But, like, one of the things that I did find refreshing about that was the, like, you see, and they're setting up, I think, for what happens in Birds of Prey a little bit, where it's like, he looks at her like a possession. He only wants her back because he can't have her. Right. And, like, for her to go, you know kind of back into that but then like swerving out of it when they by the time they're birds of prey like that's a really important arc because you know you could never bring harley quinn in and not mention the joker so like that that foundation has to be there but specifically in suicide squad there when they are introducing all of the characters at the beginning uh, uh beginning amanda waller says she is more fearless she is smarter she is like she is better than the Joker in every way. Yeah. And like, it's I, yeah. And like part of the fear that I think Amanda Waller has, like whether, like she, whether she voices it directly or not, cause I think she's might she might've said it in some of the comic runs. I'm not sure. Don't quote, but uh, is that like, she will realize that she is better than the Joker in every way. Yeah. Um, and for Amanda, I think that's that's just a facet of, like, it will make her that much harder to control as part of the Suicide Squad. But, like, that's what happens with Harley's development when she's allowed to be around Poison Ivy, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but we won't get too far into that. I believe that'll come up later. But it works, though. It, it really honestly works. Um, and it's just a great segue because... You know the the subtext has been there, been there. So I guess we can like segue into that. Where well, I have a second. Does yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, okay, my okay. bad. I'm sorry. We, I'm no, it's okay. Here. This this one will be quick and will earn me much vitriol, I'm sure. Um, Yusagi Tsukino is too good for Mamoru. She's too good for him. Name one time Tuxedo Mask has actually been useful. I'll wait. You won't get any arguments from me there. <laughs> <laughs> no, listen, Mama's fine. It's just like Yusagi can do better. Yeah. And I'm not going to say it's because Ray is right there, but Ray is right there. So. Ray is right there. <laughs> <laughs> just, so just like, all right. So I guess now we can like kind of segue into subtext um, mm -hmm. where you have these um, relationships that are platonic, but have, I mean, like really strong emotional romantic ties. Um, one of them that I want to bring up is Storm and Yukio. Because uh, that's one of my favorites um, where, like, comics won't be brave enough to, like, let them be together. But they always happen to be in the same room. And whenever they're in proximity of one another, like, they're they're touching one another. Um, but the thing that's about that relationship is uh, when Storm meets Yukio, she's at this, this point where the Phoenix Saga has happened. Um, Cyclops has left and is with Madeline Pryor and Storm is leader of the X-Men. But in doing so, it's brought out um, a lot of emotions and things that she is struggling to deal with because it's making her question who she is as a person. Is she a goddess? Is she an X-Men? Is she just a Black woman who is a mutant? Like, what is Storm? Um, and when she meets Yukio, uh, one of Storm's problems is that she has to be in control of her emotions because it is tied to her power. 
Yep. Um, so if she is not focused, then, um, you know, we've got the weather that we've got in 2020 happening. So <laughs> <laughs> with storm, <laughs> so it's really important. But when she meets Yoki, Yuki or whatever, she kind of shows her like, yo, um, it's okay to breathe a little. It's okay to live a little. Um, and that's just that catalyst that we get when Storm fully turns and is ready to break out of this shell um, that Xavier and everybody else is used to being in. Like, um, I held this against Kitty Pryde for years, but, you know, Kitty Pryde reacting the way she did because Storm changes her hair and um, is, I guess, a different person than what she's been. But, um, you know, Storm is allowed that space um, to to kind of explore that. And it's something that hadn't really been provided by Charles Xavier. Uh, one day I should have a Shockingly. panel about, <laughs> about how terrible he is, but um, <laughs> different panel. But anyway, um, I really love that their relationship because it's that catalyst and the fact that Storm is able to kind of explore and be herself with Yukio, also Logan, um, and a few other po um, and a few other people that aren't Black Panther. Yeah. Um, so there we are with that one. Um, and also, okay. Kitty Pride, since I brought up real quick, I'm sorry. So Kitty no, Pride and Rachel Summers, I am a shipper just because again, like the subtext has been there. I don't know if you all have ever read Excalibur, but if you have, it is like all up and through there. Uh, <laughs> Rachel Summers, you know, getting she would tear the earth apart um, to make sure that Kitty Pride was, sa uh, was safe and the feeling is mutual. So um, I don't know, maybe one day we'll have that stuff, you know, actualized. Just let Kitty Pride kiss hours. girls. Just yeah. let her do it. Just let her. Just let her do it. Um, you know, like, if the sex is there. Let them do it. Yeah. Like I don't make the rules, but once Ellen Page has portrayed that character, they're gay forever. Sorry, <laughs> we get that one. <laughs> it's, it's facts. <laughs> <laughs> um, so for subtext, oh boy, I'm trying to think of how I want to phrase this, because if I okay. Hmm. The original iteration of the Teen Titans, but aged when they're older. Okay. So we that that, that uh, cluster of Roy and Dick and Wally and Donna mm -hmm. is like like those four especially, um, in whatever shape, whatever. If it's like my name is Donna and this is my boyfriend Dick and his boyfriend Wally and his boyfriend Roy, we can do that. Like that, like. The, the the bond is obviously there. They are a team. They are the Teen Titans. They were the first generation of like sidekicks, right? But like the way that they look after each other and the like I was reading um the rebirth run when it was Tim Seeley was still in the book for Nightwing. And there's a whole arc where Wally um has come back from wherever they put Wally for 20 billion years. Uh, I can't Stuff get them somewhere. Oh God. I can't get too far into what they're doing with Wally because it does make me furious, but, eh. um, but like, it's just like them hanging out and like bonding. And I'm just like, you know what? I miss this. I miss this a lot. Like there's so much potential for just like a re really beautiful and caring, like romantic community with those four. Mm -hmm. Um, and like just pointedly, just pointedly to mention Donna because she so often gets left out of the original generation. But like everyone should have a crush on Donna Troy. And I would argue if you read those original Teen Titans comics, everyone does have a crush on Donna Troy. Um, I can actually attest to that because I'm reading through um, that right now for a cyborg piece that I'm writing. And mm -hmm. yeah, that's that's factual. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And also, um, every now and again, you do need to punch Dick Grayson. Because uh, that happens a couple times. Yep. Um, because, <laughs> <laughs> because Bruce. Um. <laughs> oh, Bruce. <laughs> All right. So some of the messy real quick. We'll, we'll get into that. Um, my favorite uh, is Quicksilver, Crystal, and Norman, the real, real estate agent. <laughs> the reason... <laughs> The reason why I love it so much um, is first off, um, Scarlet Witch and uh, Vision, that is also another romance that when it works, it really works. And um, that little pocket of time where they were a married couple and, you know, 
<laughs> being a sentient vibrator and a, and a witch together um, was something that was near and dear to my heart. Um, but I bring them up is because that's how Crystal meets Norman, the real estate agent, uh, at a Christmas party, nonetheless, where Magneto shows up. So uh, they start a love. That's a lot in one sentence. (laughs) A lot in one sentence, but it's very much the truth. And it happens in one issue. But uh, they meet one another and it works out because Quicksilver is, you know, being Quicksilver, being a jerk, basically, um, an unattentive one. And, you know, not to like you know, make excuses for Crystal uh, having an affair, but hey, I I got it or whatever. So she <laughs> is willing to almost die to come see Norm, the real estate agent, because, you know, inhumans can't come to earth just, you know, all willy nilly and they have to take mm-hmm. medicine and everything. And she's like doubling up on the dose just to come see this man, like lying to her sister-in-law um to come see norm the real estate agent and they actually end up getting caught because wanda i'm not wanda but crystal passes out from poisoning um because the herbs atmosphere is just so terrible which is factual as well yeah yeah so, um, that tracks <laughs> tracks so um that was just something that i i loved it because it was something that was definitely that could have been in a, a soap opera or like a <laughs> rest of our lives days of our lives or something like that and those also have a sweet spot, a uh, sweet spot in my heart. So um, that's a relationship that I enjoyed a lot. Then there's Emma, Jean, and Scott, which I know, but it works uh, just because uh, <laughs> when they're having their little mental uh, love affair or whatever, Scott finally gets down to the reason why um, he is the way that he is. Um, and hum, Emma actually helps bring that out, and Scott subsequently does become a better leader from their entanglement. But um, that's another one that man, it's just really terrible. But I just really enjoy it a lot. <laughs> All right. Okay. So, if, if you have anything to add, Lab, or are you ready for questions? Um, I mean, I think the only messy one that I have off the top of my dome is Bat Cat. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Oh boy. Um, yeah. I'll just go on the record and say that Tom King handled that the best way that he could have possibly handled that situation. That was a lose lose for everybody. Yeah. If Bruce would just let her do crime in peace, then we could all be happy. Right? She yeah. wasn't hurting anybody. Those museums got insurance. Yes, they do. And it's stolen property anyway. So they're exactly. <laughs> okay. We're Selena right. Kyle did nothing wrong. Anyway. Okay, we're ready. Uh, and this is actually, and this actually takes us back to your, to your uh, Emma, to your Emma, Scott, and Jean. Uh, one of the questions that has come, come up is, do you think that Scott and Jean Grey are an example of a bad couple? Yes. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Um, and I hate it for them because, like, it should work, but it just doesn't. Um, uh, mainly because... There are two people have that have yet like a lot of Xavier students to really deal with issues outside of I don't know like humans don't like us we're the good mutants and mm-hmm. let's fight the bad ones um, and they don't they don't ever deal with that um, while and because of like them. yeah and because of like the uh, environment that Xavier has like built around those poor kids like it's like okay maybe if they had a more open space to like talk about things scott would have dealt with the fact that he's got like you know some abandonment issues because of his dad and maybe gene would have dealt with the fact that she has a terrible dark cosmic force locked inside of her because of her idiot teacher <laughs> i don't know the cosmic holy spirit as i like to call the <laughs> force but like but sadly like it's just like like you said should work but um they just they're not at a space where they're ready to really open themselves up to other people while they're together because they're not open with themselves. Yes. Um, and they, and, and because of that, they hinder others growth. Yes. Um, a lot. So sadly, no, yeah, that's a bad one. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have a couple more minutes left. So I have some, some, I think they're kind of quickies. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, do you have any ships that you sort of desperately want to see go canon, but also some that you kind of like love, but just in your head and you're like this, I like this in my head, but I actually don't want to see it happen. 
Uh, yeah. So the one that I want to see happen, happen um, is Yukio, Storm, and Logan. Um, for many reasons, I feel like they balance each other out, and that would just be fun. Um, and then a relationship that I don't necessarily want to happen, but I like it. I'm sorry, y'all. Uh, Superman and Wonder Woman, just because they're so sweet to each other, and yeah, I, I feel you. And yeah, but I don't, I don't ever want it to actually happen. It, it's okay in my mind that I. I have <laughs> Um, my desperately wanted is Jason Todd and Hel Bert Helena Bertinelli, and my I'm okay with it in my head is probably Thor and Aurora, because I don't trust anybody at Marvel to handle that. <laughs> but in a reality where it would get handled well, yes. We yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Give me the storm storm. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thunder and thunder. Yes. Um, okay, so uh, last one, and then I want to give you a chance to promote anything that you're working on, but uh, all-time favorite number one ship. Oh, God. I know, it's hard. <laughs> oh. No, not for me, unfortunately, because I spent too much time with them, and that is Mr. Miracle and Big Barda. They're just something so beautiful to they're me that um, their love story came out of something so heinous and terrible. Um, and that they're able to be vulnerable with one another. I think that just says a lot about their characters. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I love that you talked about that in the beginning. That was great, the, the big part of Mr. Miracle. Uh, Sailor Uranus and Sailor Neptune. Forever! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yep. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. Um, so, uh, we should probably wrap up soon. So okay. do you have anything that either of you, this has been really fun. I wish we could, I wish we could talk more and I, I feel like we have some other, um, another medium that we could continue this, this conversation on. So, yeah, absolutely. Um, and speaking of continuing the conversation, so, um, I've written about a couple, a couple of the ships I've talked about, but if you want to see more, um, I'm a freelance writer. Uh, most of it is for sci-fi fangirls. So if you go to the link um, in any of my bios at Steph underscore I underscore Will um, on Twitter or Instagram, you'll find links to that. And I go into big detail about a lot of these relationships. Um, and as far as anything that I'm working on, um, there was a Kickstarter I have for Living Heroes, which is a mashup of um, some of my Marvel favorites in the sitcom Living Single. Uh, that is almost it. done and complete and yes. actually will be available for those that um, missed out on that Kickstarter. So um, be on the lookout because there are some shipping that goes on in that that I think um, I hope you all like, but I definitely have a nice storm surprise and <sighs> Misty Knight and uh, um, Sam Wilson for good reasoning. Um, I'm just on Twitter. Uh, at Lev Strong, that's L-E-V-S-T-R-O-N-G. Um, I'm just some guy, and I just talk about stuff. I don't have any projects, so. Lev's really cool, though. So uh, <laughs> they are giving so, themselves enough credit. So you can come talk to me about whatever ships. I'll engage. It's fine. 